Well, good morning. <laughs> Third time's a charm. This has been happening a lot to me lately. It, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what's all going on. But anyway, I apologize for those interruptions and um, lost you a couple times. So if you're on here this morning and um, you're watching, say hello. Say good morning. So <clears throat> again, I'm Jim Moore. This is Words of Encouragement, program number 377, Open the door. We're going to be talking about how to open the door of the Lord, how to, um, you know, the Lord set before you an open door, and uh, there's uh, possibilities there, and we want you to embrace them. Hi, Mom. God bless you. First one on. Nice to have you this morning. So we're in the Thanksgiving season, and um, it's a wonderful time to be reminded of the things that we're thankful for. You know, sometimes life's difficulties uh, have a way of trying to uh, manifest, good morning, manifest in such a way to where we give all of our attention to them. And, you know, one of the cures for um, feeling overwhelmed or sad or depressed or whatever is simply to be thankful. The Bible sa says that we... <laughs> I've been blumbling over my words this morning. I apologize. I don't think I had enough coffee yet. The scriptures, the Bible says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Now, what a great little instruction. Here's how we enter. Good morning, Gene. My friend, good to see you again. We enter his gates with what? How do we enter his gates? By Thanksgiving. One of the most surefired ways that I know about to get inside the gates of the Lord, okay? Gates, doors, entryways, right? When you talk about a gate, you're talking about a doorway, okay? Same thing. One of the access points into the presence of the Lord is through Thanksgiving. And so, uh, we're talking about open doors. So this is one of the ways that I've learned, uh, according to the Word of God, how to access His presence. You know, there's just nothing better than that. The Bible says in His presence is fullness of joy. In other words, you can't get a better joy, you know, than what you get in out of His presence. And when you're in His presence, I, you know, this is why we want to go to heaven, right? This is why... Every funeral I've ever been to, the guy, the gal goes to heaven because in our heart of hearts, we know that there isn't anything better than that. It represents the ultimate. Well, heaven is because of God. And it's not just niceness. It's not nice housing and nice fields and streams and unpolluted land. I mean, yeah, and angels and creatures and all that. That's all great. But it is Jesus is what makes heaven heaven. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So, uh, his presence in the heavenly realm is heaven. That is heaven. When we talk about heaven coming to earth, we're really uh, speaking, at least foundationally, of the manifestation of his presence. Now, the earth is full of the glory of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is, is all around us all the time. <clears throat> but there is such a thing as manifested presence. In other words, presence that you become aware of, presence that you suddenly feel, a lot of ways to describe that, but in his presence is fullness of joy. Do you need joy today? I do. I need joy today, okay? Every morning I get up and look outside at the Oregon weather, and it's rainy and icky. I know that doesn't bother some people. It, I don't like it. I don't like it. I know we need the rain. I, everybody says it. I don't want to hear it. Anyway, anyway I need the joy of the Lord. <laughs> so in his presence is what? It's fullness. You can't get a greater level of joy. How many times have I heard drug addicted people, uh, myself included, many, many years ago, about 40 years ago, deeply involved in drugs and alcohol and so on, and the Lord delivered me from that. And I remember more times than one saying, I have never had a high like this. Now, I've had some pretty outlandish uh, times of being intoxicated or inebriated or whatever. I'm not proud of those times at all, because I don't believe they're God ever. But, um, but nothing. Nothing eclipses, okay, uh, heaven in the room, okay? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Whether it's heaven in heaven or heaven right there in your room, nothing. There is no high that equals that. 
And because, and the reason why is not just because it excels in, in the experience, but it's because it's not a counterfeit. You see, what you feel when the glory of the Lord comes into your room or into your vehicle or into the church service you're at, or when you're working at McDonald's, it doesn't matter. That glory that you feel really is heaven. That really is the presence. It is his presence that makes heaven heaven. And, uh, and it's accessible. The really, really super good news is that heaven, his presence, wherein is fullness of joy, is accessible. All right? And so we're going to talk about that today. Open the door. Open the door. Now, got a few scriptures, but I just want to start out by saying this morning again, I uh, really, really uh, am encouraged every time. Hi, Kevin. God bless you when I am able to come into the presence of the Lord. And some of you are going to hear stuff that you already know. It's okay. Okay. There's no high like the most high. That's, right. That's a great saying, as a matter of fact. There's no high like the most high. Yeah. Give a start to Kevin. That's awesome. Um, some of you, this is going to be stuff you've already heard. That's okay. We're talking about recently building our foundations. You want a strong foundation so that when the storms come, and they are actually not coming, they're already here, they will not blow your house down. Jesus talked about that. One of the foundational things is learning how to access the presence of God and learning how to go through the open door. Uh, John, in the book of Revelation, uh, he says, I was in the Spirit, okay, on the Lord's day, okay, the day of the Lord. I don't think that meant Sunday. Don't want to mess up your theology, but regardless of whether it does or not, it was this is the day the Lord has made. So that could even be today. This is the Lord's day, all right? It's his day. It's not my day, it's his day, all right? He was what? In the spirit of the Lord on the Lord's day. Whatever day that is, okay? He was in the Holy Ghost. That's what matters, okay? Don't, don't, don't spend so much time thinking about the day that you missed being in the spirit. It's being in the Holy Ghost that mattered on that day. And that was an access point to him. When he was in the spirit, what happens is, is I looked. So in other words, my attention was gazing upon him, upon heaven, upon the things of the spirit. Okay. I looked and saw a door open in heaven. Okay. So one of the ways, good morning, Randy. One of the ways we gain access through the open door is coming into the, the spirit of the Lord. So I was here this morning. Um, here's something that I found. I'll just give you a little piece of advice here. You can take it or leave it. But when I go to prayer in the morning, and I morning is best for me, I, I often, when I'm still getting ready, because I get ready, I take a shower, I have a really strong cup of coffee, okay? Because I, I may look like a morning person, but no, I am not a morning person. So I, while I'm still getting ready, going through the motions and getting fully awake because I want to go into prayer fully awake. I don't want to go in there. I've done this many times on my knees. I barely did anything. I'm sleepy. I fall asleep. You know, wake up two hours later. Oh, Jesus, I'm sorry. I don't want to do that. But I will often ask the Lord while I'm still in the shower, getting my coffee, Lord, I want to meet you right now. I'm going to, I'm going to go in the prayer. Now, I believe we can walk in the spirit and be in a constant awareness of the Lord. Totally believe that. That is the goal but I also know that the Bible teaches that we should go to the secret place. He that dwells in the secret place with the Most High will abide beneath the shadow. It is a literal plan of the Lord. It is a concept that he designed. Um, yeah, I don't know how else to say it. To help you with that final goal of dwelling in his presence all the time is starting out by coming to the secret place. Okay, there's really... Yeah, for for purpose of explanation, there's only two places when you're alone and when you're not. When you're in the secret place and you're in the public place, okay? Uh, you know, you're, you're locked away and you're not, okay? So, undoubtedly, the Lord spoke about this, about the secret place. He says, we go into your closet. We call it a prayer we, whatever. He says, go in there and shut the door and your father that sees you, what? In secret. Will do what? Reward you. Didn't say in secret, although I think he does often, but he will reward you openly. So the very goal, okay, again, like Psalm 91, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide beneath the shadow. In other words, you go in the secret place. When you leave, you're under the shadow of the Lord. You want to learn how to abide in the presence of the Lord all the time, okay? 
It does not come all by... I, I know a lot of people won't agree with this statement. I'm going to say it anyway. I believe the ancients taught this. I've experienced it myself. Being aware of the presence of the Lord. I think Bill Johnson talked about like hosting the dove, like a dove being on your shoulder. There's lots of ways different people have illustrated this. But the idea of walking in the presence of the Lord all the time is not automatic. Good morning, Cheryl. How are you? God bless you. Good to see you. Um, it's not automatic. It's not something that just happens uh, willy-nilly. It is something. There are levels of walking with the Lord that are available to those who want them. Okay, the ground is level as far as salvation goes. Everybody is on the same level, okay? Young, old, you know, ethnicity, socioeconomic um, economic status, okay? And that's level. But, so salvation is free. Salvation is there for the asking. Jesus freely gives it. He's not going to turn away anybody that asks. Entrance into heaven, sins washed away, him living on the inside, that's all free. That's not something you earn. That's something you ask for and receive by faith. He paid the price for that. You can't pay. You shouldn't pay. You don't pay, okay? But what you do have a say in is how close you are, okay? Many scriptures. Hi, Sarah. God bless you. Are you watching from Hawaii? <laughs> okay. You do have a say about how close you want to be, okay? Again, many scriptures talk about this. Probably the one that sticks out most to me is the one that declares, draw near to the Lord and he will draw near to you. That insinuates there's a closer place to be. We all say that. We all believe that, okay? There, it's, there's always more, right? There's always, you get to determine how close you are. Now, I know that's a huge paradigm shift for some people because somewhere along the line, they have been brainwashed or or whatever taught you know convinced to believe that it's all up to god your nearness to god is up to him and you know whenever he wants to move on you he can do it and and it's just kind of up to i used to believe that years ago when i was a young person uh, i believe that pretty much my encounters with the lord were dependent entirely mostly upon him i mean i'd come to prayer every day not really expecting him to encounter me Maybe others are completely different. Maybe sh things have shifted enough in the body of Christ where we believe differently now. But I kind of thought it was up to the Lord. And part of that was because of the preaching of the day that basically said, hey, we live by faith. You know, you don't live by feelings, you know, and there's some truths to that. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, the, the Lord will, you know, he'll, his presence will come in you when he's ready and blah, all this stuff. And the Lord had to take me through this process of teaching me I could access his presence as an act of my will. Now, I'm not God. I'm not, it, it doesn't like I, you know, you know, I, I get to turn on, flip a switch and he's at my beck and call and no, no, no. He lives inside me all the time. Okay. But that doesn't mean we're always in his presence or, or aware of it or feeling it or whatever, whatever. Okay. So Thanksgiving, we're in that season. One of the great ways to come into his presence. Okay. Another one is he inhabits the praises of his people, okay, praise, worship is very connected to thanksgiving, same thing. Uh, I tend to, good morning, Sandy, I tend to start out my time with the Lord with worship. Uh, I was raised in a, in a Christian uh, church, an environment where we worshiped the Lord and we prayed, but you rarely did the two together. We had the, the harp, which is worship, and we had the bowl, which is the prayers of the saints, Bible says so. Okay, but never the two shall meet. <laughs> so now that may seem like an ancient, like, because this has become such a common thing to mingle worship and prayer together, uh, the harp and the bowl, that most of you, that it's not even a second thought. But there was a time, trust me, then that was not the norm. Okay, and it wasn't even that long ago. All right, things are changing in the body of Christ. Aren't you glad for that? So I start out with Thanksgiving, with worship. At least I try to. I don't always remember to do that. But I pretty consistently like to put on music. And the reason I do that, it's not always worship like some popular, you know, worship uh, song that's, that's uh, on the Internet. Uh, sometimes it is. Uh, I like to use uh, IHOP, uh, the live uh, from the prayer room, uh, you know, in real time in Kansas City, Missouri, the International House of Prayer, where they've got people worshiping day and night. I love that because it mixes intercession with worship, which is what I'm attempting to do when I come before the Lord. So that really helps. 
The other thing I like to do sometimes is put on instrumental music. Okay, so what does all this have to do with opening the door? I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Hang on. Hi, Mike. Mikey. <clears throat> so the worship focuses my attention on giving thanks and praise to the Lord, which opens the gate. Okay, you know, enter his gate with thanksgiving. Okay, enter his courts with praise. So, and then after a period of time, I move into intercession or I use conversation. Oh, I was going to say, sometimes I just use instrumental music that doesn't have any words. Okay, I have a couple that I really like. That, again, they're on the internet. Uh, pipe them into my little tiny stereo system I have here in this room. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes I just have music, anointed instrumental music going in the background. You know, which again, kind of engenders in my heart uh, thanksgiving and worship and so on. So anyway. If you have a struggle with that, if you have a struggle with spending time with the Lord, maybe you need to shift the way you do it a little bit. One of the great, great ways that will help you uh, come into the presence of the Lord is worship, because we uh, we enter His gates with thanksgiving, okay, and uh, He inhabits the praise or the worship of His people. I know worship and praise are different things, okay, uh, and in His presence is fullness of joy. So there's a good starting uh, point. So I'm going to inject right now. I've got a couple links at the bottom of the page. I'm not going to go into them, but they are more current event kind of stuff. If you uh, are into that, you can take one of them's Charlie Kirk. He's a great speaker, and the other one is Candace Owens. So that's all I'm going to say about that. So let's go right into the Word of God. Let's go into the Bible. And I feel led to pray this morning because I felt like the Lord was telling me that there was someone today who has an open door set in front of them. Paul said it this way. Um, I don't want to go too deep in that, but he said, There is set before us an open door, but yet, however, there are many adversaries. Uh, there is a bit of a teaching that's gone around the body of Christ uh, that really kind of needs to be debunked. And that is that whenever the Lord, uh, you're in the, you know, the will of the Lord, doing what he wants, being led by the Holy Spirit, it's going to be easy. I've heard especially some young people say, oh, it's always easy, it's easy, it's easy. That's not exactly lining up with the scripture. I'm just saying, I'm not saying it's always hard. Okay, sometimes there's an open door, boom, things just fall into place. You've all experienced that. It's just like boom, 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 boom. And it's like, man... I wish it was this way all the time, you know. But then there are other times, like Paul said, there is set before me an open door, but there are many adversaries. In other words, the enemy sees it. He knows the potential of it. He goes after it. Okay, I don't believe that is always the case, but it is most certainly sometimes, maybe often the case. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to be aware. Yeah, we have to press in. We have to, like, uh, uh, who was it? Um, Elijah. You know, he knew he had the promise the rain was coming. There's no doubt in his mind. If he didn't believe it, he wouldn't have prayed in the first, I bet he did. He prayed and the rain stopped. He prayed again and the rain came. But before the rain came, what did he have to do? He had to lay hold of it. He had to go after it. Now, why does the Lord do this? I don't know why he does it. I mean, he's God. I guess it's because he gets to be God. All right. There, I think every case is a little different. Sometimes you, you don't have to press in. You just like barely think of it. It says, before you even call, I'm going to answer. That's the truth, right? So sometimes that's what, I, what we tend to do is look at one way and make that the rule. And that's not how it works. Every scenario is different. Every situation is different. Crystal, nice to have you. So in Elijah's case, he had to pray what? How many times did he have to pray? Okay, seven times. Seven times he knelt and he put his face between his knees. That means he was ardent in his prayers about it. And finally, he saw a little tiny sign. He goes, that's it. And he starts running. So <clears throat> what I'm going to talk to you today is about an open door that isn't open yet. I want to talk to you today about you opening the door, not outside of the will of God, but with the will of God, but a door that will not open unless you put your hand on the handle and open that door. Now, I know right now some of you are being theologically shaken to your core <laughs> because you've told, been told that whatever is God's will will kind of automatically happen. That, my friend, is not the truth. As a matter of fact, most of the time, now God reserves the right to, again, do whatever he wants. Sometimes he opens doors. You, you don't even ask for doors. 
Sometimes you ask and he opens them. Sometimes you don't even ask and he opens them. Sometimes he really requires you to do your part. I love one of the sayings you've heard me say many times. It's I think it's a Mike Bickle-ism, okay? You cannot do God's part and God will not do your part. Okay, now that is not 100%, very rarely is anything 100%, but in most cases there is a part. That's why we call it partnership. You know, <laughs> partners in a ship, okay? You're going somewhere, okay? And who are you part You're partnering with the Lord. I partner with the Lord through prayer this morning about this program. I partner with the Lord. I often don't get a lot ahead of time because I'm doing this every day. And if I had to get it ahead of time, I'd spend all day every day. You know, so I have to partner with the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, what is it you want to say today? And this is how God does it. You see, when Jesus would go to heal somebody, he demanded partnership of them before they experienced their healing. Often, often they had to stand up or stretch out their hand or throw away their cloak or roll up their mat. He was always telling them to do something before they even had the strength to do it. And you've seen other people do this when they pray for people's healing. They, they you know, kind of help them get out of the wheelchair winner. There is a part that you have to play. Again, God won't, uh, let me say it right, you can't do, you're unable, you can't do God's part, he won't do your part. And uh, most of the time he's really pretty consistent about that, asking you to participate in the process. Okay, I have a story about that. I don't think I want to tell it today. But All right, so you need to open your door today. I feel like I'm prophesying to someone today. The Lord has set before you a door, but you need to open the door. You need to make an effort. Instead of saying, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord to open a door, the Lord says, I'm waiting on you to put your hand on the handle. Now, I don't know who that is or how that plays out to you individually, okay? So please don't ask me because I don't know. But I do know that sometimes, many times, perhaps most of the time, we stretch out our hand, Okay, even though we feel like our hand is withered, okay, stretch out through your withered hand. We put our hand on the doorknob, we turn the door. We used to call it knocking on doors. So um, <clears throat> when I was a kid, I went to, I remember as a, a young believer, I, uh, you know, kind of had some hyper faith uh, stuff going on in me. I think everybody does at first, maybe. And uh, I remember, I, I don't know exactly the circumstances, but I needed a job. I was living in my parents' home still. I was a young man, and, and, uh, and I remember my dad asking me, I think this is a true story. <laughs> it's either that or I envisioned it. I don't, anyway, uh, you know, coming to me and saying, son, you know, you need to get a job. If you're going to stay here, you need to get a job. I'm pretty sure it was a real story. You need to get a job. And I'm like, dad, I'm praying, Okay. I'm, I'm believing the Lord, you know, and I don't know what I was thinking that one day I was just going to get a phone call or, you know, maybe I'd heard those fantastical testimonies where someone had just, you know, been going about their own business and suddenly something fell on their lap. We love it. That's kind of like healing, you know. We love it when it's instant and, and miraculous and all that, but we don't like the kind of healing that says stop eating Twinkies every day and start drinking water and exercising, that's a form of healing that God put in our body. You see what I'm saying? So, and uh, my dad's like, son, you know, I'm glad you're praying, but you need to get out and knock on some doors, right? Isn't that what we believe? So if there's an open door set before you, or a door set before you, and it hasn't opened yet, I want to say to you, thus saith the Lord today, go knock on those doors. Go put your hand on the handle and open them up. All right, so I'm going to go, uh, let's look at a few scriptures, because these are important scriptures. This is not just about you, okay? It's a, it takes in a big field here. But the first one is in Isaiah 22, 22. Now, uh, all of you, have you ever heard the phrase, let me read what Randy said here, God is not a God of, of action, he's a God of reaction, our faith. No. All right, yeah, I mean, amen, God responds. Now, have you ever heard, that's a great saying, Randy, have you ever heard the phrase that says, God helps those that help themselves. Now, where did that come from? Was that just some individual that suddenly came up with a nice poetic sounding phrase and it became popular? No. The idea was in the church many ages ago, 
the concept was this very thing, that if it's God, it will just happen, God will do it, and no one, you won't have anything to say about it, it'll just happen. It, it was a misunderstanding of what we would call the sovereignty of God. And so basically that had to be corrected, and so eventually uh, preachers, I don't know which one, started using this phrase, that basically God responds to you when you act in faith. Okay, if, you, if you're asking the Lord for rain, okay, Lord, we need the rain, and faith says, this is a silly illustration, but faith says you're going to, when you go to the front door to go to walk out, you're going to put your raincoat on. You're going to grab an umbrella because you're really actually believing it to happen. If you're asking the Lord for a job and yet you never go out and look for one, so you, you see what I'm saying? So the Lord helps those who help themselves. All that saying is partnership. All that's saying is God might have a desire to do something in your life, but if you're not willing to participate in the process and to do your part, then you, it may, you may think you're waiting on the Lord when actually the Lord is waiting on you. So let's look at Isaiah 22, 22. Now, the famous scripture about the Lord saying, I have set before you an open door, no man can shut... Um, you know, open and no man can shut and so on and so on, is actually found in the book of Revelation. We'll go to that in a minute, but it is a quotation. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking, and he's speaking to the church of Philadelphia, but he is quoting an Old Testament passage. All right, in Isaiah 22, 22, anybody ever see numbers? Okay, this is a number I see a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the key of the house of David. Now, this is talking about a up-and-coming ruler named Eliakim. I'm not going to go into the history of all that. You can read it. But as often happens, especially in the Old Testament, when there's a messianic prophecy of Jesus, it is it begins talking about an individual, a real life, flesh and blood human being whose situation is being prophesied about and suddenly a phrase or a statement or a passage of that prophetic word applies to the coming of Jesus as well. So it's a dual prophetic word, if that makes sense, okay? Many of the prophecies of Jesus apply to the individuals that were being talked about in the time they were given, but they also refer to the coming of the Messiah who would bring complete fulfillment to that prophecy. Okay, it's a, it's a long process. I won't go into it. This person, Eliakim, was going to be a leader of Israel, and the Lord is prophesying through Isaiah what's going to happen to him, and this is a part of that prophecy, and this is actually what Jesus quoted in Revelation 3.8 about opening a door. Now, why does this matter? Okay, I'll get to that in just a second. Let's read it. And the key, remember the word key, the key of the house of David. Now, the house of David means the household of David. It didn't mean his physical house. It meant the kingdom of David. Okay, David's household was the was a kingdom. Okay, it was an earthly kingdom that he tried to make like a heavenly kingdom. He's the first heaven on earth guy. Okay, the key of the house of David and the kingdom of David, which actually Jesus said that his kingdom would be like the kingdom of David. He used that phrase, the kingdom of David. Okay, so that means that David got his kingdom pretty right for Jesus to say, yeah, like that. Okay. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. Okay, now what does it say about Jesus? The government will be on his shoulder. He's going to bear the government. Now this is the spirit, the government of God. So we're not just talking about, you know, the government of the United States or Malawi or China. You know, we're not talking about earthly governments per se, although there's some things there, but He's ultimately talking about the go the government that he the Lord will govern. He will. Okay, those of you who say government doesn't matter. You're just you're just not right. I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. You need to read the the scriptures. What it says about that. It's not some irrelevant thing out there. Okay, it says that the governing of the planet will be on his shoulder. In the Old Testament, he actually showed the governments of the earth as images as idols that eventually his government looked like a rock, okay, because he is the rock that was thrown at the feet of those governments, and then his government, it says, grew into a great mountain that it says would never end. So he, the government, will ultimately be on his shoulder forever. We will always have some form of governing. God governs different than people do. So anyway, my point is not government. My point is an open door, but it's important that you understand that Jesus is the one who, or it is said of him, 
that the government will be on his shoulder. And so that's a reference to this as well. Okay, it says, I will put the key of David. Now, what does a key do? A key unlocks doors, okay? So God has a door for you that he wants unlocked. So we think it's all in his hands. And remember, he's created the door and he creates the key. And then most of the time, he gives the key to you. Okay, I know it's a big paradigm shift, but often he gives the key to you. So he's taking this key, he's laying it on this guy. His, this guy's name is Eliakim. Okay, his name means something. I'm not going to go into that. It says he, I'm going to lay the key of David on his shoulder. Again, prophecy about Jesus, but at the same time, it is a prophecy about this man Eliakim, who's going to be a ruler over Israel. So this ruler over Israel is becoming a prophetic picture of the ultimate ruler over Israel. And, hear me now, the ultimate ruler over you. Okay? The guy who wants to reign as king in your life. The guy, the God-man, okay? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit that wants to sit on the throne of your heart and say, not, not make me God, but acknowledge that I already am God. Good morning, Anne. And acknowledge that I am the creator of the universe. I have set before you an open door. And it is my intention that that door is open. And God could open the door by himself, but many times he will wait. He will actually hand you the key and he will wait for you to exercise your God-given spiritual authority to open that door. All right, so let's see what he says. The key to David I will lay on his shoulder so he will open and no one can shut. Here's a great thing about when the Lord makes a door for you, and then uh, even if it requires you to do your part, remember, again, you can't do God's part. That's making the door and making the key, but he won't do your part. That's a great saying, and it applies in most cases. Again, the idea that some have come up with that if it's God's will, it's always going to happen, that is just not true. Okay, we have something to say. We've been given authority. Some of the things that God intends on doing must be done through our partnership and cooperation. Maybe not every time, but I would say most of the time. He will open and then will shut. Now, who's, who's opening the door? Who's opening the door? In Isaiah 22, 22, who's opening the door? Eliakim has opened the door. This is not the Lord saying, I will open the door. The Lord said, I've set before him a door. I've made the key. I lay it on his shoulder. Now, shoulders speak of burdens, and again, our concept of a burden is something bad. Oh, I'm just so burdened. So, but biblically, when it talks about a burden, it simply spoke of carrying a load. Uh, the word burden is often referred to as a cart that is full of sheaves. Okay, it is, it is weighty, but it's not necessarily uh, oppressive, if that makes sense. Okay, and in this case, the weightiness of having a key is called a burden. Again, I don't think that word burden means a bad thing, but it is something he has to carry. There's a responsibility with it. And I do believe that's one of the things that the Lord wants to get across to us when an open door is in, or a door is in front of us. We're talking about doors that haven't opened yet, is that there is a weight to our responsibility. That's why the shoulder, because the shoulder carries, right? The shoulder bears responsibility, bears weight. The priests who carry the ark carry it on their shoulders, okay? Jesus, the government will be on his shoulder. What is that saying? It's saying that speaks of responsibility, the weight of responsibility, okay? He, Eliakim, New Testament, he, Jesus, will open and no one will shut. The great thing about when the Lord makes a door and in your partnership, you use your authority and the keys he's given you to open that door, people can't shut that door. So what does that mean? That means people didn't open the door People can't shut the door. We used to have a phrase, and I think sing some songs, where we said that the uh, he will give you joy that the world didn't give and the world can't take away, that I, something like that. But that's the idea. If man opens the door, man can shut the door. If God through you, through you, because again, we're not saying that God can't open the door by himself, okay? There's been an open door set before me. I get that. And God can do that without any participation or even faith from you. But it's a rare thing. Most of the time, he does require faith. Again, we use the illustration of people being healed. Often, Jesus said, 
to a guy who couldn't stretch out his hand, stretch out your hand. To a guy who couldn't roll up his mat, roll up your mat. To a guy who couldn't get up and walk, get up and walk. Why did he do that? That almost seems insulting to us. No, he's trying to activate their faith, something that's in their heart, moving to their flesh, that God wants to react, as our friend Randy said, God wants to respond to, okay? What are you doing or not doing that is provoking or not provoking a response from the Lord? Okay, now you may think, well, if I'm doing something, that's me opening the door. No, no. If you're doing it without partnership, if you're doing it on your own volition and with your own ambition, but if the Holy Spirit has impressed you, and listen, give yourself some grace, right? Give yourself some grace. We don't always know for sure, okay? You know, say, how do I know the will of God? Well, you just don't always know the will. You press in, you pray, and then you listen, and then you have to act. That's why we call it faith, okay? Who was it that said uh, uh, faith is spelled R-I-S-K? Okay, there is a risk. You know, I was talking to somebody yesterday about that movie, um, The Last Crusade, you know, with Harrison Ford, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Tomb Raider, whatever, the last one where where he's going to find the chalice, you know, the, the cup of Christ, and, um, and he's required to step off a ledge onto a platform that looks invisible, that he does not see. How many times are we asked? to step out on air. There's a saying, fortune favors the bold. I'm in the midst of, of making decisions in my life right now that are extremely challenging for me. Some of you are as well. We're in a time of shifting all over the planet right now, and the Lord is asking and requiring, in some cases, for us to put our hand on the doorknob and to uh, open the door. And in this particular passage, He's saying, I have a key, I have a door, God is saying that, and I'm giving it to this guy, Eliakim, who is a prophetic picture of Jesus. And when he, whatever he opens, uh, or if he opens that, no one will be able to shut it and vice versa. Okay, so let's skip to Revelation chapter 3. Jesus, the fulfilling of what we read in Isaiah 22, 22. <clears throat> so I want to ask you the question, who really has the keys? Okay, let's read it. Jesus talking to one of the seven churches of Asia, the one that we like the most, okay? This is the Church of Philadelphia, which means phileo is, is uh, friendship or love. It is the lesser form of love. Agape is that I'll die for you love. Phileo is more of a, a lesser, not a casual, but more of a friendship kind of a love. The Church of Love is Philadelphia, okay? Um, Delphia is uh, speaks of brotherly that's why we call it brotherly love okay so this is the church age or the portion of the church at any age that is walking in the love of christ that has understood that the first commandment is our first priority not the first the great commission okay the great commission is our first assignment but our first priority heart priority is we love you can accomplish the winning of souls, you can accomplish healing bodies. There's a lot you can do, but if it's not done from a, a heart that's motivated by love, the Bible is clear about this. It says you can give your body to be burned. You can do, you can prophesy, you can do all these things, but love is the thing. So God says, let's make sure that the the main thing is the main, or how do we say that phrase? The main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. And God says, that's the love of God. Okay. So the church of brotherly love is the best example we have of the church age. Let's read what it says. And this is Jesus talking here in this book. Remember, the book of Revelation is not just a book of end time events. Jesus talks in the book, okay? Here, I mean, just these are the words in red, just like in the gospel. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, okay? And I think when he said churches, he didn't just mean those seven. You know, there were actually many more churches in Asia Minor, at the uh, time that this was given, when Paul or John was on the Isle of Patmos, many other churches, but God picked seven of them, I believe, because they represent the church really globally throughout the ages. Okay, I'm not going to go into that. So, but he says, you have to hear what I'm about to tell you, not with your physical ears. I've, I'm, I want to tell you something, and you need to discern. You need to have your sensitivity engaged and heightened so that you will not miss what I'm really saying and reading between the lines. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to you, to me. You're a church, the church, I'm the church, okay? 
Yeah, we are the church of God, right? Because he dwells within us. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So individually, corporately, all of it. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write these things. These things says the one who is holy. That's Jesus, okay? The one who is true. He says, I'm the truth. And he who has the key of David. Here's where he begins to quote Isaiah 22, 22. He that has the key of David, okay? So, now think about this. In the Old Testament, Hilkiah, an up-and-coming ruler in Israel, was given the key. Who gave him the key? Here it says, he's the one. Jesus gave Hilkiah the key. Jesus gives you the key. To do what? To open the door that he's put in front of you. What am I saying? I'm saying that he can open the door, and he does that sometimes. I, I don't want... We have a tendency to be either or. Well, you got to do it every time. God's doing it without you. You know, <laughs> the truth is both things. There's some truth in both of those things. There's partnership with the Lord. I think that happens most of the time. I know I'm repeating myself, but I think it's important. And then there are those times where the Lord does it without our, he doesn't ask us. He doesn't tell us. He just does it. Okay. And, and that, that happens. And I'm grateful for that. But I would say most of the time, he says, I'm going to give you the key. Okay? I made the door. I made the key. I'm going to give it to you. You have something you have to do. What is missing? Friend, listen to me. I want to be very, very sincere about this. I know people who have been waiting their whole life for a door to open. And I do get that sometimes the prophetic words that the Lord gives us or the promises he puts in our heart or the dreams that he gives us are out there. And sometimes they are out there a long ways. And there are those who, these all died in faith, having not received the promises. I know that. I believe that happens. But I've also seen people that I truly, in my heart of hearts, I'm not their judge, but I've seen them waiting for stuff that I'm pretty sure that they could have had many years ago. But fear or whatever, okay, uh, influences, Bad decisions. I knew a woman once who was called to be a missionary. The Lord actually, I think, appeared to her and told her that. And she was so desirous to be married. She married a man that was unsaved, and she never got to be a missionary after that. I'm just saying the decisions we make, the the laying hold of the key and putting it in the lock and turning the door, the effort that we give to that promise sometimes is the the thing that will make all the difference. All right, so who has the key? Jesus has the key, but he gives the key. Let's see what it says. He that has the key of David, he opens and no man shuts. He shuts and no man's open. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door. No man can shut it. Okay, we're going to skip past that because there's just, I don't have time. There's just so much there. What I want you to understand is that if you have a key to open a door, it's because the Lord himself, Jesus is the one who's giving it to you. Perhaps, I want you to consider this, perhaps you have the key already available to you. What may not happen in the kingdom today because you choose not to do it? I am stunned um, at the impressions that the Lord gives us that are often a still small voice that are easily disregarded. I've just seen this in my own life many times where the Lord has impressed me uh, slightly. I, I like big impressions, okay? You know what I mean by that? Like God just really hammering you, hammering you over and over, you know, signs and wonders and dreams and, you know, prophetic words and all this time. And he'll do that. He does that. But a lot of stuff that's just day-to-day -day stuff, it is a still small voice. And I have seen many times in my life where I just kind of almost casually responded to a prompting and the results of that, pro that my effort, my, my obedience, my acting, my doing my part were huge. And I afterwards just went, God, I so easily could have missed that. You know, because I was afraid or because I was too busy or whatever. And then you know what that does? It makes me wonder, how many things have you prompted me to do that I missed? So our goal is to be sensitive and quick to obey, to open that door. All right. So I'm going to end up here. Last one, Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. We're talking about keys and doors. We're talking about opening the door. 
my whole point of this message, I believe from the Lord, is to say, and this probably doesn't um, apply to everyone that's listening, obviously, but the principles do, okay, in large, in the way we live our life every day. But I believe there are actually some people listening today that you have, a, a door has been set before you, but it's not yet open. And perhaps the Lord is saying, and I think I will end with a story as an illustration here, but perhaps the Lord is saying, I have given you the key. Now it's your turn. Okay. Find the door, put the key in and turn it. So the last thing Jesus said, uh, Matthew chapter 16, 19, again, his words, and I will give to you the key of the kingdom, keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. All right. So the Lord is saying, you must do your part. I'll back it up, okay? If you don't do your part, there is no backup. Whatever you bind, whatever you loose, whatever door you make an effort to open. Now, again, say, well, what if I make the wrong mistake? Well, listen, the Lord is very good at throwing up the red flags. He really is. Uh, we don't, my my good friend Jacob Ray, uh, I love him so much. He, uh, he used to have a phrase, and I really enjoyed uh, I really got a lot out of it. He talked about the Lord uh, speaking to him and telling him that, Jacob, you don't operate with a red light waiting for a green light, which is, I think, what most Christians do. He said, you operate with a green light, and God will give you the red light if you're, if you're missing. So it reminded him and I think it's a great illustration of Paul on his missionary journeys. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm sure there were times he had a prophetic word and all that, but other times he just said, you know what, we need to go. Okay, there was a need, it needs to be filled. Now, I'm not saying he didn't pray about it, but he just had this impression in his heart. And he said, we need to go visit the churches. Okay, so as he went, he had a green light. What did Jesus say? The last thing he said, go. <laughs> go. That's green light, go, right? Everybody say green light, go. Hi, Wendy. Good morning. So the Lord has given a green light. He's given you a green light. He set a door in front of you, but he's saying you got to go through it. You got to make an effort. Like the like the sick man, take up your bed. Okay? I can't take up my bed. He's saying, "Well, as you start, you will be able to." It's hard to steer a car that's not moving. Okay? You know, it's it's difficult to to be able to steer a, a car that's not a moving car is easier to steer. And so he says, stretch out your hand, do this, do this, act, act. Hi, John. Hi, Wendy. So <clears throat> Paul, he was going about his way. He's going, he's saying, okay, we're going to go here, then we're going to go here, and now we're going to go to Asia Minor. What did the Lord do? He's operating on a green light, and the Lord does what? He gives him a red light. He stops him. So I wonder if we need to shift our confidence from from the weightiness of needing to have a perfect and clear word so that really faith isn't involved and we don't make a mistake to trusting that the Lord will give us a red light when needed. I've seen way more, and I, I want to be very sensitive about this because I'm not trying to be critical, but I've seen way more Christians who didn't do anything because they were afraid of making a mistake than I have seen Christians that were being presumptuous and just doing whatever they wanted to do, okay? Way more. Why is that? Because we sincerely want to please the Lord, right? We want to be led by the Spirit. We want to do what He says. We want to love Him enough to hear His voice. We don't want to just step out and create an Ishmael or whatever. You get, you get it. It's, it, I think, often comes from a sincere heart. However, that can easily drift over into faithlessness and fear. Oh God, I gotta have five prophetic words, and I gotta—I'm gonna throw out these. Uh, uh, you know, I need some signs. You know, here and actually, the Lord was always giving signs, and yet He actually rebuked people that had gotten into the habit of demanding a sign before they would believe. Okay, I'm gonna finish with a story. All right, and this has to do with raising funds. Well, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I often use this story when I talk to people about fundraising because that's that's my life I've been living for 40 years. All right, but let me tell a story. And this is a true story, okay? And I'll end this up in, in hopefully just a couple minutes and then I'll let you go. 
All right. Somebody out there needs to hear this today. I had a 10-day prayer excursion that God had radically impressed upon my heart to do. There was no question in my mind because of the way he showed me. I won't go into that. But I, this was one of those I knew that I knew things. 10 days in the, in the uh, Bend High Desert uh, area. Okay, so the Lord says, I want you to go into that area and I want you to pray for 10 days. All right, so that's what I was doing and um, took off, kissed my wife goodbye, went there. God had already made a way for me uh, to stay at some friend's home, a friend's house. Okay, so I had a place to stay. <clears throat> I had food. I was all set. So I begin my prayer journey. I was a couple days into the prayer journey, a few days, I think, maybe three days into the prayer journey. And uh, hi, Dale. <clears throat> God bless you. And uh, suddenly, the unexpected happened. I lost the place to stay. Something happened in the, my friend's home. Uh, they said, "This we're going to have to go, or this person's coming out. I don't even remember what it was, but they said, "You're gonna. I'm sorry you can't stay. Okay? No fault of their own. And so suddenly... Three days into my 10 days of prayer, I have no place to stay. I have no money. Well, I had $5. $5 exactly is what I had. $5. And so I'm praying and I'm asking the Lord, what do I do? Lord, I don't know what to do. I can't go out and rent a motel. Okay. I, I don't have any resources at this time in my life. I don't know. I have anybody to ask. I don't know what to do. What do I do? Here's what the Lord said to me. Okay. Memorize this phrase. He said, Jim, participate in the process. Four words. Participate in the process. And I'm like, I thought that's what I was doing. I thought I was part. That's what I, I am part. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes the Lord will tell you stuff and you're like, no, that can't be true. Well, anyway, part, and so I said, okay, Lord. So I humbled myself when I stopped arguing. And I said, Lord Jesus, okay. Apparently, there's another level of participation that you're asking. I want to do it. You're saying stretch out your hand, roll up your mat, grab a hold of the key, whatever. Okay. I will participate more intently in the process. Anything you want me to do? So I'm praying. I'm sitting in my car, okay? I am <clears throat> at the end of the day. Now, it was uh, at such a time... And I'm, I'm trying not to make this too long here, but it was at such a time that I was not comfortable. I've had times where I spent the night in my car and all of that. Uh, kind of older now. This wasn't that many years ago. I was like, God, I cannot. I just cannot spend. And I wasn't feeling like he was saying, go park in the desert and spend the night in your car. I feel like I needed a bed to sleep in. Yada, yada. That was kind of established in my mind. So I said, Lord, I'm coming to the end of the day. So think about this now. This is the fourth day. Hi, Terry. Fourth day on my prayer journey, okay? And I don't know what to do because I don't have a place to go. So I'm praying and I'm saying, Lord, I, I, I did a number of things trying to figure out something. It just wasn't working. That's when the Lord said, participate in the process. So I told him I thought I was doing. Okay, so it's getting nighttime. I finally, you know, resigned myself to do. I pull my car over. I'm in the city of Bend, Oregon. As I'm talking to the Lord, I pull my car over and I, and I say, Lord, anything, anything you tell me to do right now, I'll do. Because I know you don't want me to go home, but I'll have to if I don't have a place to stay. I am at the apex. I'm at the point where if something doesn't open up, if a door doesn't open for me, I'm going to have to go home and not fulfill what you've asked me to do for this, these 10 days. So immediately, now here's where it gets kind of funny. Immediately, the Lord said, call your mom, your mommy. <laughs> okay. You know, sometimes the Lord will ask you things that, do, that seem really unreasonable to you. Okay. The wisdom of man is not always the wisdom of God. Matter of fact, often it's not. My response to that is no. I am not going to call my mommy. I'm a 60 or 58 or whatever old I was, year old man. I am not going to call my mommy and ask her for money. And uh, so 
I responded that way. And I felt like he said, don't, you know, I'm not saying ask for a minute, just call her and ask her to pray. Often, one of the first steps the Lord will ask you to do in the process of opening a door is get someone to pray with you, okay? Don't do it on your own. Get some prayer people behind you. So I said, all right. I know, great man of faith, right? Jim Moore, great man of faith. So I, I said, all right, Lord, I'm going to call her right now on my cell phone, but I will not ask her for any money. That is not what I'm going to do. I'll just ask her to pray. And he's like, I could, it's like I say, mm -hmm, yeah, whatever. So I call my mom. Okay, I pull off to the side of the road in front of a business. I pull out my phone and I call my mom. And she's like, hey, honey, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. And I start telling her my need. I said, mom, I really need you to pray. And I said, I'm not asking for any money, but I really need you to pray. Okay, I, and then I explain the situation about the 10 days in my house. Uh, I lost the place to stay. I don't have a place to go. I don't want to sleep in my car. I'm, I'm going to have to come home if God doesn't open the door. And she probably doesn't remember this. But she says, oh, honey, I don't have any money. And, you know, my mom has been a huge uh, giver into our ministry. And so, yeah, so I, she she said, and it just made my heart, oh, my God, what are you doing to my heart right now? And um, and I said, mom, I don't, I'm not asking. I just want you to pray and, and so we're talking a little bit about it. It's a short conversation, five minutes. And, uh, and she says something. She utters a phrase to me that shifted everything. And it was so the Lord what she said. And I'm sure it just was a thought that came across her mind. But this is the process. She said, you know, you should try the Motel 8 because they typically have the cheapest prices in town. That's what she said. Okay, you should try the Motel 8 you know, I had no money, right? So, you know, $5 in my pocket. She said, you should try the Motel 8 because typically they are the cheapest place in town. Now, God is my witness. You don't have to believe this, but this is the absolute truth. I look out the passenger or the driver's side of my window and across the street is the Motel 8. Okay, now that should would be enough right there. You talk about a sign. On the reader board, you know, where they write stuff, it said, and I quote, we have the cheapest prices in town. I was so awakened now, my faith so encouraged, but the fact that she just said the very thing, said the phrase, I didn't even tell her. I don't know how much she remembers if mom used to watch, but I didn't even tell her. I just said, mom, I got to go right now. <laughs> so I hung up the phone. I called her later, but I hung up the phone I, I drove across the street, parked way, way in the back of the parking lot. I'm not really sure why I did that. And then I said, oh, my heart is beating, right? Because now I'm thinking, this is God. This is God. This is God. Talking about participating in the process, doing your part, okay? Listening and acting, all right? So I get out of the car. I, I very quickly walk into the front door wondering, what's God going to do? What's God going to do? I step in. And there's a line of three or four people at the desk waiting to check in. And I think to myself in my carnality, oh, praise the Lord. This will give me some time to think about what I'm going to say <laughs> to this lady because I got no money. Right? And no credit card, nothing to lean on. Sometimes God does his best stuff when you have nothing to lean on. That's a word for somebody right now. So the guy right in front of me, as we are waiting, turns to me and starts talking to me. And he's, hey, how you doing? Oh, you good. You live around? And we just caught, have a conversation. He starts telling me how that he just came from this place in Redding, California. And of course, my antennas went up. And I'm like, oh, Redding, there's a church there that I've been to many times, Bethel Church. And he goes, that's where we were at. In the course of the conversation, I found out he was a retired youth with a mission leader. So he's a missionary. Okay, I consider myself a missionary, okay? Different kind than a foreign missionary, but still, there's lots of missionaries. And we get to talk, and I tell him, I'm the director of the Salem House of Prayer. And, and uh, yeah, this is just a few years ago. We're like, we're having this great conversation. He winds up telling me that he had been to Reading because his wife, get this now, was in stage four cancer, had stage four cancer. And I'm thinking... Not only am I going to get a room, but God's going to heal this woman. I mean, it's really starting to unfold, and I'm feeling the presence of the Lord. And 
Now I'm saying all this for a reason. Sometimes just because you step out and do what you're supposed to do doesn't necessarily mean everything's going to fall into place. And the enemy will try to come in the midst of this and tell you what a fool you are and how, how foolish you look right now because you stepped out on air and you fell flat on your face. So right now it looks really good. I'm waiting. This guy steps up, gets his room reserved, okay? And uh, as he's walking out, it's my turn to step up. He shakes my hand and, said, and I said, hey, can I come out and pray with you when this is done? And, and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I step up to the lady as he's walking out the door of the lobby. And the lady's telling me it's like $85 a night. And I said, I said, um, I said, well, I'm going to look around. Because see, this is what my answer. I'd already, I'd already worked this out of my head. She's going to ask for money. I don't have it. You know, unless so, this guy, I'm thinking this guy in front of me is going to give me a room. He doesn't do that. He doesn't offer that. And so... Um, so I had prepared what my response was going to be when she turned, when, you know, when I didn't get the room. Okay, this is what we do. We prepare for failure. So anyway, so I said, well, I'm going to look around a bit. Okay. And that was my excuse. Instead of saying, I don't have any money. <laughs> okay. So I step away. I walk out of the room. I walk out of the lobby and I go up and I meet the guy. And yeah, I'm a little disappointed, but I'm, you know, whatever. And I go to I pray with him. I pray with his wife. I have a prophetic word. She's crying, crying. It was a wonderful time. I am actually lingering, okay? Still thinking maybe this guy's going to offer to buy me a room, but I linger, I linger, I linger. Nothing happens other than the great things that God's doing in the spirit. So finally, we said our goodbyes. I walk away downcast, downcast. Lord, I don't understand. I walk all the way around to the back side of the parking lot where I parked my car. Climb in my car. I'm right back where I was an hour ago, sitting in my car, wondering what I'm going to do. Would have been so easy at that point to just feel defeated and give up. Some of you who are listening are at that point right now. You said, try to try to pray to pray. Okay. You cannot, you cannot act in faith on the assumption that every time you do exactly what you think is going to happen will happen. There has to be a level of surrender to the Lord. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to do it in faith. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to be okay with that. Okay. Because if you don't, gradually the enemy will try to get you to where you are not willing to make any steps of faith. So anyway, I get in my car. I sit there. I'm praying. I, I bow my head. It's now like nearly dark. End of the day. I have to go back to Salem a number of times. Okay. I must've sat there for 15 or 20 minutes. A number of times I literally put my hand on the key to the car and started the car and was ready to go. And something in me said to wait. And so I turned it off. I turned it off. This went on for a good 15 minutes. The last time I'm right, I'm like, okay, sometimes, you know, we're so close to the victory. Sometimes we're right at the top of the mountain. We're near the mountaintop and we give up right before God does something. And I literally was about ready to go. So I start up my car. I put my hand on the knob. I shift it down into drive and something caught my attention out of the corner of my eye. I look off to my left and I see one of the side doors this is not the entrance door. This is just some back door to the motel. I see it open and a man stick his head out the door. And I'm like, no way. Is that the guy? Is that the guy that I pray? Is that him? And he looks up and down the, the parking lot. He's looking for me. He looks up and down the parking lot. I'm, there's only a couple cars in the lot. And then finally, he sees me. He lays, he fastens his gaze on me and he throws open the door and he starts beelining towards me. And I'm going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what's happening, what's happening, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I'm just about ready to leave. And he walks up to me and I, and we greet each other and he says, hey, I want to ask you a question. Did you not get a motel room because you don't have any money? And I hesitated and I said, yes. And he says, I knew it. God was talking to me and I was slow to respond. I'm going to get you a motel room tonight. Participate in the process. Maybe the door 
is waiting on you. Okay, it's not always that way. And I, you know, I wish there was a, a way to know every time. I don't know. There's, again, you cannot, you know, surgically remove faith out of the equation. There's always going to be faith. So bottom line was, I got the room. God made a way for the rest of the time I was there. And uh, yeah, he was glorified. I learned a huge lesson then. Just because you ask, if you don't do your part, most of the time, if you don't do your part, if you're afraid or unwilling or think you can look foolish or whatever, and sometimes you know what? You might look foolish. You have to be willing to take the risk. Amen. All right. God bless you. I went a little bit over, and uh, I hope that encourages your heart today. If you've got a door that is set before you and it hasn't opened yet, don't give up. Don't put a period where God puts a comma. Amen. Lord, bless your people today. Encourage your hearts. Help them to act in faith. Show them how they can participate in the process. And let that door finally be open for them. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. God bless you. Um, we've got a Thanksgiving meal at the House of Prayer tomorrow night. For those of you who are local and you'd like to come, that's 7 o'clock. And we're doing this instead of the EGS, Encounter God Service. Bring some food. Bring some fun. Bring your party with you. Bring Thanksgiving. We want to have you. We'd love to have you if you are able to be here. And then um, the next day, again, if you're local, uh, Jim Huggins, a candidate for governor of the state of Oregon, we'll be hosting him in the same cafe. We do our stuff in the cafe at 1 p.m. So 7 o'clock tomorrow night and 1 p.m. a Saturday afternoon. Both of those announcements are right here on Facebook. So God bless you. We love you. Hope to see you. And as always, give yourself permission to have a great day.